because because I managed to convert the lectures to the old to the old format. I hope maybe maybe that'll be better for some of you guys. Um, okay. Okay. So I want to begin the class today by continuing to tell you about the, the cyclic polytope. So let me just remind you what the definition was. The moment curve is basically the points of the form. You want them to be column vectors, right? So the points of the form t, t squared, up to t to the d for t a real number. And we call this x of t. And so we said that to define the cyclic polytope, what we're going to do is just choose d points on that curve and take the convex hull. Right? So cyclic polytope c sub d of t1 to Tn is the convex hull of endpoints on this curve. x of T1 up to x of Tn. Okay. And what I showed last time using this uh, determinant of Vandermond, is that any, is any d of these points are affinely independent. Any d of these points sorry, any, any d plus one of these points are affinely independent. And remember that the, the way that we showed is, is that we took, we just computed the Vandermonde determinant and showed that it wasn't zero. And, uh, and then we obtained that any d of these, any d plus one of these points are finally independent, meaning that any d plus one of them uh, form a full dimensional simplex in R to the d, right? If you're in R to the d, then a simplex has, a full dimensional simplex has d plus one vertices. What this says is that any d plus one of these points form a full dimensional simplex. Okay. So then let me make a simple observation. Which is that this polytope is simplicial. And remember that simplicial means that every facet has to be a simplex. And the reason is that, you know, here's, here's, the, here's the polytope. And let's say that you, that you take a facet, OK? So let's say that this is a facet right here. That means that it has dimension d minus 1, right? Now, because these points, all of these points are finally independent, that means that on a hyperplane of dimension d minus 1, you can have at most d points. You cannot have d plus 1, because if you had d plus 1, then they would form a full dimensional simplex. So f contains. d 
the vertices. Because if, if you had more than D, they would be affinely dependent. Question? In your D sub D of E1 and Cn there, uh -huh. doesn't that end in E D plus 1? Uh, no. So n has to be at least d plus 1, but it could be more. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking this moment curve, and I need to take at least d plus 1 points on it, but I'm taking n points where n could be bigger than that. So then your C, CD might not be uh, a simplex. Right, so C, CD is not, is not a simplex, but it's simplicial. Remember what I said last time? Is that a polytope is simplicial if all of its facets are simple? But the, but the polytope itself does not have to be a simplex. And that's why I'm saying consider, one fa consider a facet. The facet contains at most d vertices. Okay? But if you have a polytope in, in d minus 1 dimensions, and it, it can only have d vertices, then it could only be a simplex. There's, there's nothing else it could be. Okay? The only polytope with, with, of d minus 1 dimensions with uh, at most d vertices is a simplex. So F is a simplex. Okay. I just don't understand why your facet can't have uh, more than D vertices in this case. Because if if the facet had more than more than D plus one, if it had D plus one or more vertices, yeah. then because because of this condition, those D plus one points would be affinely independent meaning that they would span a d-dimensional plane, which contradicts the fact that, that we're on a facet yeah. that has oh, one okay. smaller dimension. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why this polytope is simplicial. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do next. Maybe, I don't know, it's, it's hard to draw this moment curve because, well, it's in d-dimensions and it, it's, I don't know, it's some curve. So I'm just going to draw something, and we're going to pretend that that's the moment curve, OK? So here's, here's something like that. I don't know. Suppose that this is the moment curve. Some curve. And I'm taking endpoints on there. OK, so let's say that they are t1. T2, T3, just trying to match the picture that I have here so that you You can use these notes. So let's say that I chose 15 points on the moment curve, OK? And this is in some dimension. Um, actually, let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Let's say that we're in R8. OK, so here are 15 points on the moment curve. And so this is. This is the polytope C sub 8, comma 15. Okay? So now what I want to do, my next goal is to describe for you what are the facets of this polytope. Okay? And I mean if, if the curve is hard to draw, you can see that I'm not gonna be able to draw the polytope for you. But basically it's the convex hull of those of those points, but those points are in eight dimensions. We can't really see very well what's going on. But what I'm going to do is for example, I'm going to show you that these points form a facet. Okay. 
What I'm going to do is the following. Let's say that let's say that we, we take a subset of the endpoints. In this case, a subset of the 15 points. Now, how many points do I need in order to hope to have a facet? The, the dimension, right? So if, you, if you're hoping to describe a facet, then that facet should be seven dimensional. And because, because this thing is simplicial, that means that we need eight vertices, which, the, which is determine a seven dimensional plane, okay? So let's consider D vertices, in this case, eight vertices. And let's say that HS is the affine hyperplane. Determined by, it, by the points X of T sub I, where I is in S. Okay. So as an example, I have these points over here, and they determine some seven-dimensional plane. By the way, why is it seven-dimensional? Because, because these guys are all finally independent, right? So that means that any eight points are going to determine a seven-dimensional affine hyperplane. And I call this h sub s. So in this case, this is h sub 3, comma, 4, comma, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 14. Okay? And so the question is, is that hyperplane a facet or not? That's what I want to know, okay? So here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say this is a facet hyperplane if and only if the following is true. Let's, let's do this. Let's say that Let's say that this H sub S is described by the condition that X, these are the points X such that F sub F of X equals zero, okay? So that's, that's the equation of the, of the hyperplane, okay? Where F, F S is some affine linear function, right? So this might be two X plus three Y Minus four equal to zero. That's the equation of of this thing. Okay. So basically, th this is going to be a facet hyperplane if and only if, like you kind of see in this picture, all the points that are not on the hyperplane are on the same side of the hyperplane. Okay. That's what will make you a facet. If 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 you form a plane and the whole polytope is on the same side of your plane. Whereas if I had a hyperplane and I had vertices of the polytope on both sides, then this could not be a facet. And so H of sub S is a facet hyperplane if and only if the function F sub S of Ti has the same sign for all I not in S. Okay, but now look at this function f sub s of ti. Sorry, really?
really the points here are x of t1, x of t2, and so on, right? Because this is the moment curve, so the points on it are the form x of something. So really, I wrote this wrong. Instead of writing s sub s of ti, I should write f of x of x of ti. Okay. So let's consider this function f sub s of x of t. So what is this? This is f sub s of t, t squared, up to t to the d, right? f sub s is an affine function. And what we have here is just powers of t. So that means that when I, when I distribute whatever this is, this is going to be a polynomial of degree d, because it's linear in these things. This is a polynomial, I guess, of degree less than or equal to d, because there's, clear, there's clearly nothing bigger than, bigger than degree d, but it could be that, that there's no t to the d there. Okay? But it's a polynomial. Okay? And let's, let's see. This is the graph of the polynomial, right? I mean, this is the graph of the polynomial. So where is this polynomial positive and where is it negative? Well, here it's either positive or negative, but it hasn't changed sign, right? It changes sign as soon as you cross the hyperplane. Every time you cross the hyperplane, you go from positive to negative. So if here it's positive, then here it's negative. So you, so you cross the hyperplane, and then you become negative. And then you cross the hyperplane again, and it's positive. Positive, 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 until you cross the hyperplane again, and the function is negative, and so on. Okay. So it's positive on these places, negative on these places, positive on these places, negative on these places, positive, negative, positive. Okay. So you see what I'm saying. So for example, if if you pick this point x of t, then f of uh, f sub s of x of t is positive. But if you pick a point down here, then f of s of, of f sub s of x of t is going to be negative. Okay. Here the function is positive. Here it's negative. Okay. So, what can you tell me about about this hyperplane? From this picture, you can see that this hyperplane really is a facet hyperplane. Because all the points that are not on the hyperplane, all of these guys, are on the positive side. And, and you see there's no points on the negative side. There's no points on the blue part of the curve. Okay. So this, this illustrates why this really is a facet hyperplane, because all the other points are on the positive side. So let's, let's spell this out. When, when does this function change sign? It changes sign when t is equal to t3. If it goes from positive to negative. When t equals t4, it goes from negative to positive, and so on. So this function changes sign. Whenever t is equal to ti, tj, let's say, or maybe let's call it t sub little s to be suggestive. Okay. So it changes sign every time that you cross one of the points t sub s with s in your set. Okay. And so. You see the, the reason why the reason why we have a uh, an, a facet hyperplane here is because here we have things that are not in S, okay, and then when you go into S, then we have three and four, so you, so you changed 
sign twice before you left S. Okay, so one and two are not in S. Then with three you change sign, with four you change sign, and then you're back in F. You're back leaving S. Okay? So then here five, six, and seven are positive, and now you have to see how many times do you change sign again before you leave S again. Well, with eight you change sign, with nine you change sign, with ten you change sign, with eleven you change sign, and now you're positive again. So the good thing is that between eight and eleven you change sign four times, which means that you haven't changed sign. Okay? And then you're at 12, and then you see, okay, how many times do I change sign now? I change two times before I leave S again. Okay. So, so what you need is that between any point not in S and another point not in S, you should have an even number of points in S so that you change sign an even number of times, which means that you didn't change sign. Okay. So that means that this is true if and only if these little blocks of consecutive numbers in S are all of even size. Let's call them consecutive, consecutive blocks. I'm leaving a little space here, by the way, so if you're taking notes, leave a space here. All consecutive blocks of S have even size. Okay. So I'm leaving a, a space here because why? Does anybody see why? For example, I mean, the, the, the point is this. The point is that on the, on, the very, on the very end, you don't really care. So, let, so let's maybe do a bigger example. Okay. This could continue. And it could be. That this graph goes here and then and then does t16, t17, t18, and then it and then it goes down. Okay. So this would be an example in a higher dimension, right? Because now I have um, 11 points, so that means that this would be an example in in R11. Okay. The thing is that. You don't care that you change sign three times here because there's no more points outside of S. Okay? So you don't care if, if here you're positive and here you're negative because you don't have any more points in S. So that means that the final block can be odd, and that's fine. The final consecutive block can be odd, and the initial consecutive block can be odd, and, and those are not issues. So you don't care about that. And so what you want is that all inner blocks all inner consecutive blocks of S have even size. And by inner, I mean not, not the initial or final. Not necessarily the initial or final. So you don't, you don't care if the initial and final blocks of S are, are even or odd. You just, you just care about the intermediate ones. Okay. Any questions about that? I think it's good if we do an example so that, so that we make sure that we understand what we're saying here. So let's say, for example, that D is 3 and n is 5. Okay? So what are the facets? So what we're supposed to do is that 
we have we have the numbers from 1 to 5 and we're supposed to choose 3 of them right because d is equal to 3 okay um, and we're allowed to choose them in whatever way we want but the the condition that we need is that the the inner blocks that we choose better have uh, even size. So that means, for example, that here's a non-facet. So a non-facet is something like 1, 3, 4. Wait, sorry, that's a, no, that's a facet. Why is that a facet? So let's put it in the, in the list of facets. Because we have two blocks. The first block is the initial block, so we don't care about its parity. And this is an intermediate block, and it's even. So that forms a facet. So can you give me an example of a non-facet, then? 1, 3, 5. So why is that uh, non-facet? Because this is the initial block. This is the final block. We don't care about those. But then this intermediate block has, has odd size, so that doesn't, that doesn't count. This is a non-facet. Another example of a non-facet would be 2, 4, 5. Okay. Because this, this final block we don't care about, but this is an inner block of odd size. Okay. So I'm underlining the, the violation of the condition. So I'm going to make a list of all the facets. Okay. I did this carefully ahead of time, so. But let me know if it's not clear where, where I'm getting these. So 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 5, 1, 3, 4, 1, 4, 5, 2, 3, 5, and 3, 4, 5. Okay? So these are the facets. I, I don't care about the block containing 1 or 5. But every inner block, in this case, there's no inner blocks. In this case, there's no inner blocks. In this case, this is an inner block. In this case, there's no inner blocks. In this case, this is an inner block. And in this case, there's no inner blocks. So you see all the inner blocks are, have even size, so those are facets. And you can check easily that the, non the other things are not facets. Actually, why don't we just do it? Because there's not many more. So what else am I missing? 2, 3, 4, and 1, 2, 4. So 2, 3, 4, this is an inner block, and it's odd. And here, this is an inner block, and it's odd. Okay. And that's it, because 5 choose 3 is 10. So, so these are all the, all the 10 possible facets. These are facets, and these are not facets. Okay. Now, think about it. If you have the facets, can you tell me what all the faces are? For example, the, in this case, we're in three dimensions, right? So the facets are all triangles. So can you use this to tell me what the edges of the polytope are? And if so, how? So basically, you just need to, you just need to look at the subsets of the facets. The, the thing is that because the facets are simplices, then every every face of a, every face is a face of a facet, and all the all the because the facets are simplices, their faces are all simplices. So that means you know if I have a triangle one two three, that means that one two is an edge, one three is an edge, two three is an edge. It's the only way that you could have a triangle. All, all the three have to be edges of the polytope. So I just need to look at the subsets of, of anything here. So 1, 2 is an edge. 1, 3 is an edge. Let's do it alphabetically. 1, 4 is an edge. right? It's a subset of this one. 1, 5 is an edge. 2, 3 is an edge. 2, 4 is not an edge. right? Because you see, 2, 4 is not an edge of any of the triangles. So 2, 4 is not an edge. 2, 5 is an edge. 
3, 4 is an edge. 3, 5 is an edge. And 4, 5 is an edge. So the only non edge is 2, 4. Okay. And finally, the vertices, OK, well, that's easy. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay. And by the way, you, you, you can always do this. If, if, you, if you know the set of vertices, and if you know the list of all facets and what vertices they contain, then by, by intersecting these sets, you can obtain every face. Because every face is an intersection of facets. In, part in particular here, here you have the whole combinatorial structure of the polytope without even having to draw it. Right? I haven't drawn C305, but I, but I know exactly what the combinatorics looks like. Right? This is the complete list of faces. Okay? Does that make sense? And you see, by, by what I'm showing you, I mean, initially, we defined this polytope to, de to depend on these parameters t1 up to tn. But if we look at this description, we see that the description doesn't depend on those parameters t1 up to tn. Right? And so what that says is that it doesn't really matter what the parameters are. The combinatorial information is going to be the same. Yeah. Do you require that t1 is less than t2 just in case you're comparing with the parameters? Yes, th that's, that's a good point. So I am. I probably should have said that, that throughout this whole time, I am assuming that, that they're in this order. Because that's the order in which I'm listing the blocks. OK. So this is a description of the facet hyperplanes. And let me say as a corollary, The following. If you have, let's say that you have k points of your cyclic polytope, okay? Let me call them x sub t sub i1 up to x sub t sub. I k. Okay, so just some subset of the points, and you want to know if they form a face. Form a face of the cyclic polytope like this. And to to be to make completely sure that you understand what I'm saying, let's let's just choose some points here. Okay, so maybe. Five, seven, eight, twelve, and uh, sixteen. Okay, and we want to know if those five vertices form a face. Well, it turns out that this is this is true. They form a face if and only if at most. D minus K inner blocks of S are odd. Okay. So think about it. If if K is equal to D, then we're saying that D vertices form a facet if and only if at most zero blocks, zero inner blocks are odd. So all of them are even. So when k is equal to d, it's a translation of this. Okay. But this, this tells you what the faces are for any value of, of k. Okay. So for example, in this case, n is 18, d is 11. And so what did I say? 5, 7, 
8, 12, 16. Is that a face? So k is what? k is 5, right? Because I have 5 points. And so I need to check that at most 6 inner blocks of S are odd. It's not a lot to check. When you only have 5 things, you don't need to worry about six things going wrong, right? So that means that this is fine, this is a face. And you see that this criterion is completely combinatorial and we don't need to worry about what the TIs are, okay? So this is the complete description of the, of the faces of, uh, of the cyclic polytope. Question? Very good, so that's... So let me, f let me write something else, and then I'll write exactly that. And in the meantime, think about how strange that is. <laughs> so let me, let me repeat while I erase. What, uh, what Michael said is that any, any time that you have less than d over 2 vertices, they form a face. Think about how strange that is. But before I talk about how strange that is, let's talk about a corollary which is that the combinatorial structure of C sub D of T1 up to Tn doesn't depend on the numbers. It only depends on D and N. Okay? And so that's why we call these polytopes C sub D of N because combinatorially, they're all the same. And that's why we call CD of N. Okay? Now, you should realize that it's, it's a little bit of lazy notation. Because the combinatorial structure really only depends on D and N. But the metric properties do depend on the TIs. And so when I write the polytope CD of N, I cannot ask you what volume it has because that's ambiguous. Right? You don't know exactly what polytope I'm talking about uh, when I say this, but you know combinatorially what I'm talking about. Okay? So this is the name for the combinatorial polytope. Okay? So here's Michael's corollary. Any set of less than d over 2 elements, vertices, form a face. C sub d of n. Less than or equal. Yeah. Proof. Well, If the size of S is less than or equal to the over 2, then the number of blocks of S, I mean, if, if you have a, the, the number of blocks is at most the size of S, right? Which is less than or equal to the over 2, which is less than or equal to d minus size of s. So basically, what, what, exactly what happens there happens in this situation. The, the condition is completely empty because you don't have enough blocks to create any problem. Okay. But think about how strange this is. So for example, think about the polytope C sub 4 of or let's, let's go even simpler than this. C sub 4 of 8. How, how would I draw this polytope for you? C sub 4 of 8. If D is 4, that statement says that any two vertices form an edge. Right? 
And this is completely strange. So, for example, if d is greater than or equal to 4, any two vertices form an edge. Okay? And this is where you should realize that your geometric intuition is not going to it's, it's going to have its limits because we can we've never seen this in two or three dimensions. This is this is not this is impossible in two or three dimensions. But in higher dimensions, you have these polytopes that can be very different from each other, and every two vertices are connected. Okay. And if you're in dimension ten, that means that any five vertices form a face, any four vertices form a face, any three vertices form a face. So th this is called a v over 2 neighborly polytope because any set of at most d over 2 vertices is their neighbors. Okay? They form a face. Really we want this to be an integer so we call it, we call it like this. Okay? You don't want to be 2.5 neighborly because that doesn't mean much. So, you, so we say you're 2 neighborly. So C D over N, C D of N is V over two neighborly. Okay. Now so so this tells this tells us that we need to rethink a lot of things. Um, and for example, one one kind of natural question is okay, well how neighborly can you be then? Right? And you should realize that there's kind of a stupid answer to this question, which is that the simplex is completely neighborly, right? Because if you have, if in the simplex, every subset of vertices is a face. But the simplex is a, is a very special polytope. Okay? But these things, are not, these things are not simplices, because the description of the faces is different from that of the simplices, right? Okay? And uh, it turns out that if you're not a simplex, then this is basically as neighborly as you can be. Okay? There's nothing that is v over 2 plus 1 neighborly that is not a simplex. And that's, that's going to be a, a homework problem for the next homework. <laughs> it's not too bad, actually. I know, I know it sounds hard, but it's not too bad. Uh, if p is more than, let's say, if p is k neighborly, Where k is bigger than this, then it then it must be a simplex. Okay. So that means that the I mean I, I told you the cyclic polytope is a very extreme polytope, and this is one way in which it is. It it is as interconnected as possible. And this, this really tells you that actually we, we have very little hope of drawing a cyclic polytope because generally when we draw polytopes, we just draw the graph. Okay. So I don't know, if I want to draw C4 of 8, then I have to draw 8 vertices. And then I have to connect them all, and then you can't see anything anymore, right? And you don't even know if you got it right. Maybe that's, if, maybe that's the 4 of 8. I don't know. Maybe I missed something. So you see, there's, there's very little hope of, of, of drawing these things. But, um, and, we'll t and we'll talk a little bit more about this next time. What can you tell from a picture? What can you tell from the graph of the polytope? Well, clearly not everything, because, because here we have an example. For example, here we have a picture that's ambiguous, because this could be C4 of 8, or this could be the, the simplex, delta, delta 7. That means that you cannot tell what polytope you're looking at just from a picture. And again, that's the first time that you see this, because in two and three dimensions, it's not true. If you know the picture, you know the polytope. Okay. But let me, let me tell you another very nice property of, uh, of the cyclic polytope. The cyclic, polyt the cyclic polytope is extremely extreme in the sense that it has more faces than any other polytope. So, and this is something called the upper bound theorem. The 
the upper bound theorem says that if P is a D polytope with M vertices, then the number of K dimensional faces of P is less than or equal to the number of K dimensional faces of this guy. For every K. Okay? And that's a very concrete sense in which I mean that this is a very extreme polytope because it maximizes the number of K faces for every value of K. And that's why this is one of our favorite polytopes because it's a very natural polytope that, that it just has lots and lots and lots of faces. So this is a conjecture for a while. It was called the upper bound conjecture, but now it's the upper bound theorem. This is due to McMullen. It's one of the one of the big theorems in, in the theory of polytopes, yeah? Can we use the dual Right, so, so if you dualize this, then you know that if you have a D polytope with N facets, then these bounds are still going to be true. And that's, an, that's a very nice application of duality. So that's a theorem that we get for free by dualizing this one. Okay. Um, I should tell you, I haven't decided whether to prove this or not in this class. It's, it's, a, it's one of the early, later chapters in the book, and maybe what I'm going to do is just kind of... Uh, Keep doing what we're doing, and, and maybe if you're very excited about this, uh, tell me. And then if, if there's enough excitement, then we'll prove it. Um, if we don't get to prove it, then this would be a nice, a nice project, is to understand this proof. So maybe if you're really excited about this, you should tell me not to cover it so that you can do your project on it. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is one of the big achievements of, of uh, the theory of polytopes. Okay. I think, let me see. Yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's basically all I wanted to tell you about cyclic polytopes. And what we're going to talk about next is basically what, what can we make of these pictures? When we draw a polytope, we're just drawing the graph. Okay. And so we should talk a little bit more about the graph of a polytope. And to what extent can you tell things about the polytope just from looking at the graph? Now we know we cannot tell what the polytope is. Um, but we'll see what we can do. Okay, so we're going to spend the next couple of classes talking about the graph of a polytope and what it tells us about the polytope. Okay. All right.